Thank you. Thank you both. And our first uh, testifier today after our members uh, testimony now being received uh, will be uh, Ms. Suzanne Bibby. She's the Director of Government Relations uh, from Pro English. And uh, ma'am, you can take the phone and begin when you're ready to, uh, ready to testify. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to testify regarding HB, HB 361 and HB 888, legislation that would make English the official language of the state of Pennsylvania. My name is Suzanne Bibby, and I'm the Director of Government Relations at Pro English, a national English language advocacy organization based in Arlington, Virginia. Pro English was founded in 1993 with the mission to preserve English as the common, unifying language of our nation by making it the official language at all levels of government, local, state, and federal. I'm here today on behalf of our Pennsylvania members and 80,000 Pro English members in all 50 states. The English language is one of the strongest and most durable ties that unite us as Americans. The founders of our nation recognize this fact, which is why President George Washington in 1795 signed a law passed by Congress requiring existing and future uh, federal statutes of the United States to be published solely in English. It is why President James Madison signed the Louisiana Enabling Act in 1811. The act granted statehood to the largely French-speaking territory under the con condition that the new state agreed to conduct its official business in English. In 1906, Congress passed legislation, the Naturalization Act of 1906, uh, which became law and was signed by President Theodore Roosevelt that required people who want to become naturalized U.S. citizens to demonstrate English proficiency. More recently, state and muni municipal governments around the country have taken the initiative to pass laws and ordinances recognizing English as their official language. 31 states, a large majority, 62%, uh, have adopted laws making English the official language of government. Oklahoma became the 31st state to approve an official English law last November, when an overwhelming 76% of Oklahoma voters approved a ballot referendum which amended the state constitution and made English the state's official language. In 2008, Missouri became the 30th state to make English its official language when voters approved an amendment to the state constitution with over 86% of voter support. In fact, every time official English has appeared on a statewide ballot, voters have all backgrounds and political affiliations have approved it overwhelmingly by margins as high as nine to one. Four other states, uh, Minnesota, Nevada, Texas, and Washington state, currently have official English legislation pending in their legislatures. This is not surprising considering the fact that nationwide polls consistently show that the vast majority of Americans support making English the official language. In May 2010, a Rasmussen Reports poll found that 87% of likely voters support making English the official language of the United States. In August 2010, Rasmussen Reports um, also found that 83% of voters want a higher priority to be placed on encouraging immigrants to speak English as their primary language. A 2005 poll conducted by the polling firm Zogby International found that support for making English the official language was even higher among first and second generation immigrants than among native born citizens. Uh, an April 2007 McLaughlin and Associates poll found strong support for proposals in favor of immigrants learning and using the, the English language, requiring that all students in public schools who cannot read English be enrolled in English immersion classes so that they can be taught to read and write in English at their grade level as soon as possible received 88% support among voters and Latino voters. Similarly, making English the official language of the United States was supported by 80% of voters and 62% of Latino voters. Most importantly, Mr. Chairman, according to a 2006 poll, 77% of likely voters in Pennsylvania favor making English the official language of the state, according to a poll conducted by Mason Dixon Polling and Research. The poll revealed 63% who strongly supported such an effort. The survey found that the overwhelming majority of Pennsylvania residents want the state to conduct business in English, including strong majorities within each political party and each section of the state. Official English legislation often presents many questions about its effects and consequences. An official English law for Pennsylvania would simply make English the default language of state government operations and communica communications. Contrary to what opponents claim, official English does not mean English only. Establishing English as the official language of Pennsylvania means that for the state to act officially or with legal authority, it must communicate in English. It means that the language of record is the English language and that no one has a right to demand taxpayer-funded services or documents in any other language. It also means that unless the government has a compelling public interest for using another language, it will use the official language alone. 
You may have heard that during a recent Texas Senate tra Transportation and Homeland Security Committee hearing in June, Texas State Senator Chris Harris interrupted a Spanish-speaking witness two minutes into his testimony and asked him why he wasn't giving his testimony in English. States without an official English law, like Texas and Pennsylvania, could avoid situations like this altogether if they would simply pass legislation to make English the official language. This Senate committee hearing is a perfect example of this Texas state government carrying out an official duty. If Texas made, the, made English its official language, there would be no need for these senators to have a debate in the middle of a Senate hearing over whether a witness can testify in a foreign language. Regarding the constitutionality of official English laws, the courts have held that official English laws are valid. In 1988, a state employee challenged Arizona's newly enacted official English initiative, Proposition 106, claiming that, uh, that she had a First Amendment right to speak any language on the job. A federal judge agreed and overturned it. When the state of Arizona refused to appeal, pro-English intervened to defend the constitutionality of the official English initiative in the well-known case, Arizonans for Official English versus um, Arizona, which is 1997. Uh, after a long series of appeals of the uh, trial judge's ruling that the initiative violated the First Amendment, Arizonans for Official English prevailed at the US Supreme Court, upholding the right of states to have official English laws. So today, we have 31 states with official English, none of which are facing legal challenges. A more recent recent victory for official English took place in 2006, when the American Civil, Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, uh, filed a complaint in federal court challenging an official English ordinance adopted by the city of Hazleton, Pennsylvania. Pro-English helped uh, Hazleton draft its amended English ordinance, which resembles the language of Representative Rosemary Swanger's uh, HB 361. Subsequently, we helped the city write its initial brief in response to the ACLU complaint. After reviewing the briefs, the ACLU dropped its complaint against the English ordinance. The victory, this victory indicates that similar city ordinances and laws are likely to withstand legal attack. Mr. Chairman, Pennsylvanians have good reasons to support making English the official language of the state. First, making English the official language of Pennsylvania would reaffirm the melting pot ideal in the US and allow Pennsylvania to join the vast majority of US states that have already passed official English laws. Throughout our nation's history, we have expected new immigrants to assimilate into our common American culture, and the most important pillar in the assimilation process is learning English. This is the American melting pot. Generations of immigrants coming to the United States, to this country, to partake in all of the opportunities of American life, all the while making great sacrifices to learn English. President Theodore Roosevelt said, we have one language here, and that is the English language, and we intend to see that the assimilation crucible turns our people out as Americans. Government played an important role in encouraging the assimilation of these new immigrants by communicating with them in English. But today, instead of encouraging immigrants and their children to learn English, many government agencies at the local, state, and federal levels are making it their policy to communicate with non-English speaking persons in their native language. These kinds of policies represent a reversal of the melting pot tradition. HB 361 and HB 888 would end the practice of taxpayer-funded unofficial multilingualism while allowing for common sense exceptions for things like promoting trade and tourism, uh, engaging in international business or commerce, and where public safety is an issue. Contrary to what opponents claim, official English laws do not send an unwelcoming message to immigrants. Rather, they convey the message that there are responsibilities as well as rewards that accompany the privilege of immigration to the United States. Making English the official language of Pennsylvania will help the state foster the melting pot principle inherent in the United States' original national motto until 1956, e pluribus unum, out of many, one, which has helped make, us the, US, make the US the most successful multi-ethnic and multi-racial nation on earth. Second, making English the official language of Pennsylvania would provide a powerful incentive for new immigrants to learn English. English is the key that unlocks the opportunities of American life. Multilingual government does not encourage immigrants to learn English. It may seem like the compassionate thing to do, but removing incentives to achieve English fluency only harms immigrants. English is the language of success in the United States, and census data prove that those who speak English earn, on average, two to three times as much as those who don't. The Lexington Institute, a Washington-based uh, think tank, estimates that approximately $65 billion a year is missed, in missed wages can be attributed to workers lacking English skills. The inability to speak English traps people in low-skilled, low-wage jobs and keeps them heavily reliant on taxpayer-funded government programs, particularly on costly translation and interpreter services. Learning English has enabled generations of Americans to realize and achieve the American dream. 
Studies continue to prove that those who know English get better jobs, earn more money over a lifetime, and are more successful in school and receive better health care than those who cannot speak the language. Finally, making English the official language of Pennsylvania will stop forcing Pennsylvania taxpayers to subsidize translation and interpreter services. According to the Census Bureau's 2005 American Community Survey, 29 foreign languages other than English are spoken in the state of Pennsylvania. It would be costly, divisive, and impractical for the state to communicate in all of them, but it would be inherently unfair to operate in only some of them. Pro-English believes that the current system of quasi-multilingualism where some foreign languages are accommodated and others are not is discriminatory. The only way to make it non-discriminatory is for state government to communicate in one unifying language, English, to avoid the all too common practice of favoring a select few immigrant languages over others. Tax dollars currently used to provide official public documents including multilingual forms and informational materials in foreign languages would be much better spent teaching immigrants to learn English. These programs would not be permanent expenses to the state because once a non-English speaker learns a language, they will no longer acquire the English programs. Both HB 361 and HB 888 are good for Pennsylvania because they would not only encourage immigrants and their children to learn English and promote their successful integration into American life, but it will ultimately save taxpayer dollars. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to testify before the committee today. On behalf of our Pennsylvania members, I respectfully urge the committee to pass HB 361 and or HB 888. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Ms. Bibby, for being with us and uh, for sharing your testimony with us. Uh, we do have uh, Representative Gobbler who has a question for you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much for your testimony. I just had a, uh, a quick question about, uh, you had referenced the Texas Senate uh, committee hearing. Um, and my question is, in a case where English is adopted as the official language, um, how, would, um, how would it be handled when a uh, when somebody who is a, a foreign speaker would, would be asked to testify, let's say this committee wanted to have it, would, would, a, would an interpreter be, a, uh, be, be permitted to offer that translation in the course of the hearing to make that an English communication? Um, well, in an, a situation where you had someone say they were a legal resident, they're here temporarily, and you really wanted their story to be presented to the, the committee, um, you could, but um, if there was ever if there was a discrepancy between the English language testimony given by the interpreter and, say, the Spanish language testimony that he was translating, it would be the English language um, version that would have legal standing, that would have, um, that would be, if there was a discrepancy between the two, that's the one that would, um, that would, that would stand. You know, I, I think in our day and age of um, open records laws and so on and so forth and transparency, I think the, uh, the ability to have one set of agreed upon testimony uh, certainly makes sense. And, and I could see instances where we would want uh, perhaps even somebody from a foreign country to come testify as to some, some, you know, international issue or how some, you know, as you know, one one of the great things about uh, uh, being members of a, of a policy-making body in government is we can seek input and, and and learn from other people's successes and failures. And to to receive testimony from anywhere is great, but to to make sure that we have that legal. Um, uh, agreement upon what what is actually offered uh, certainly seems to make sense. So I just wanted a clarification on the uh, the ability to have translators. I think that would, that uh, that does sen tend to simplify things. So I appreciate the uh, and in the, the case answer. of just of Texas, um, the person who was testifying he could speak English, but he was choosing not to speak it and use an um, interpreter so he could give his span uh, lang uh, testimony in Spanish. So that case um, interpreter may not be used. Um, but if there is a case where someone is speaking, I can only speak another language, then, um, of course, it would be uh, the English language that would have standing. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Gobbler. Representative Josephs. Gracias, Mr. Chairman. Buenos dias. Bien viento. Senoras and senores, happy to see you here today. I have a question for you, Ms. Bibby. In my office just the other day, we had a woman call who had an elderly woman problem. I don't know what it was. She spoke only Russian. One of my staff people handled her problem over the phone. I only heard the Russian end on the phone in my office. I don't understand Russian. I don't know what the problem was. 
<laughs> if one of these two bills passed on, in your interpretation, would I have been able to help that woman from my office in Russian? Yes. Well, if you, one of your employees happens to speak Russian and is able to communicate with her, that's fine. She's calling, you know, it's one of your constituents, and she's calling with a question, and she can't speak English at all. Um, there's nothing in the bill that would prohibit you from communicating with her. It's for official communications only. So if she, um, again, a, a hearing is an example of an official duty of government, um, but taking a call while you're at work um, from someone that's not an official duty, um, you know, maybe sending her... Um, a constituent piece that's written, um, printed documents in Russian, um, that would not be um, a default thing anymore. Uh, but of course, uh, excuse me, I don't understand. I wouldn't be able to send her anything in Russian, is what you're saying? Right, because it wouldn't be official. It would have to be written. The English language version would be the official. Um, the same thing within the, um, the translations. Um, it would be the English language version. And, and my employee speaking over the phone officially, an official state phone paid for by the, uh, to use Mr. Perry's language, the law-abiding taxpayer, that would not be official, you're telling me. My employee over my phone in my office having to do with my service, all of which is being supported by the law-abiding taxpayer, would not be official until we put pen to paper is your interpretation. Is, is that correct? I'm just asking you. No, I'm saying that you can communicate with her over the phone. You, can, you don't have to turn someone away by you know, giving them advice if someone on your staff is able to speak English or uh, Russian. But of course, maybe hiring, bringing in an interpreter to, or hiring someone for the day to, just to talk to her on the phone, that is something that would be allowed. But if someone on your staff happens to be able to speak Russian, that's perfectly fine. So, okay, so... Thank you, Representative Joseph. We have a, I have another, another question. question. We'll Thank come back you. to you if we still have additional time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Roy Mr. Is recognized Goblis for his question. spoke at some length, and yeah, I would like a, the same You've asked a couple courtesy, questions. Sir. I'm, I'm going to come back to you. You have spoken at length, and you've asked a couple of questions. We'll come back to you for the second round Thank of questions. You, sir. Thank you, Representative Roy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before we get this law passed, I think we should seriously consider making English the official language of the state government committee so that all committee members can understand what the other committee members are saying during the meetings. But my question is, uh, under the proposed legis... I'm sorry, did you have a... Okay. Uh, I guess my question is... Uh, uh, a lot of taxpayers are concerned about the cost of having things in multiple languages. Just right out here in the rotunda, we have this little brochure that people can pick up if they want to tour the Capitol building. And with all the budget cuts that took this place this year, you know, we also print this in Spanish. So Pennsylvania taxpayers are paying to print this thing twice, and this is just one thing out of hundreds or thousands of things. Do you have what the estimates are? Like, how much would this save Pennsylvania if we only conducted business officially in English and we didn't print duplicative things in other languages? Right. Um, well, most state governments in Pennsylvania is one of them. Um, it's it's really the norm um, not to have estimates on the number or the amount of um, interpreter services and, and translations every year because very much like the federal government, they're not required to report those costs. So that's a huge problem with the federal government trying to estimate that, and that's we estimate that to be in the $20 billion range. Um, but for Pennsylvania, um, uh, Oklahoma actually was the last state to um, adopt official English, and they had estimated just from um, prior to that they uh, uh, passed a bill to limit their driver's license test to English, um, and they estimated there they would be saving about $50,000 a year just by limiting it to English, and that's just one type of document. Um, also, an, more proof of, of just the cost of printing that it would, in fact, save taxpayer dollars, I don't know the exact amount, um, is, you know, bilingual ballots. There's a, um, it's a federally unfunded mandate, and it's very much in the interest of Pennsylvania to make sure that, this, that their citizens don't just speak English, but they can speak it to the best of their ability, because because um, the Census Bureau, of course, um, uses the number of people who um, can't speak, 
can speak it well, not not well, um, or not at all, um, to determine which jurisdictions um, can have to provide bilingual ballots. And um, the counties, since it is an unfunded mandate, uh, the counties are the ones who have to um, supply the cost. They're the ones who have to cover the costs of that. So it falls squarely on the shoulders of taxpayers. Um, Cuyahoga County, Ohio, is um, one of the ones that got a, t a lot of attention last year in the 2010 election. And they are estimating for the next election, they're going to have to pay probably about $100,000 um, upwards of that amount just to print bilingual ballots in just two languages, English and Spanish. All right. Well, th thank you for your, for, for your answer. And I, I think it is a very valid issue that money that's spent to do things duplicatively in different languages, that money could be spent on hospitals, schools, on other things government does. So th right. thank, thank you so much. You. Thank you, Representative Roy. Representative Joseph. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me go back to my question about what we can do in our district offices. My district office has voter registration material. It has Spanish and it has English. I have in my, the course of my doing my <coughs> newsletter when I represented Chinatown, I've had articles in Chinese. When I had a Spanish area, I have done articles in Spanish for my newsletter. I have put article, um, languages other than English on the internet in order that my constituents can understand me and understand that I'm friendly to them and that, that I want to help them and I'm not interested in how they address me, I'm interested in how I can help them. Um, how am I supposed to know under either one of these bills which one of those things I can do to help my constituents and which, do I have to have a lawyer in my office 24-7 to tell me whether I can speak English or write English or write some other language to my constituents? That's my real question. No, um, the, the instances where you are allowed to use foreign languages, whatever they are, are listed in the bill. There are about eight of them, seven to eight, um, such as things as commerce, promoting commerce, um, international business, um, trade, um, when there's a um, public uh, safety issue. Um, but there has to be a compelling interest that it's for the common good, not just um, for a single individual. So um, a, an example would be um, in North Carolina when Hurricane Irene was coming through, um, which North Carolina is an official English state, uh, they had um, a taxpayer-funded um, toll-free hotline that um, I think it was only in English and Spanish there. But people could call in just to make sure that everyone had the information, how to stay safe, um, how to prepare for it. Um, but that's an instance where listed in the exceptions um, where translations, taxpayer-funded translations are permissible. Um, but for other things, um, you know, if there's a cost to the taxpayer, um, you know, translations or, um, you know, printed documents, those things would not be allowed. If I have a piece of, leg of literature that is uh, directed to people who are at risk for HIV or HIV positive, do I have to do that in English, even if they're not English speakers? Is that That's public, public health? Issue. Yeah, public health. Um, yeah, anything like that. You want to do flyers, or if you want. Suppose the person has tooth, tooth decay. Is that public health? Well, that probably only applies to one. Are person. you going to pay for the lawyer, or the, is the uh, law? Uh, Re Representative Joseph, I think you've probably oh. went through a series of questions here, and I think it's more kind of argumentative at this point. I'd, I want to know it. how I'm going to run my district office, and so does every other official in this room. Thank you. If these bills pass, they are genuine questions. Do I have to have a lawyer in my office at Thank all you, times? Thank you, Representative Joseph. The question's been asked, the question's been answered, and I will now move on to uh, Representative Stern for his question. Thank you, Ms. B Bibby, for um, testifying before the committee today. Um, I just have a, um, have a question and, and a thought, but um, and getting back to, and I was listening to the line of questioning from the uh, Chairman uh, Josephs, uh, in our court systems currently, uh, I have friends that I know, and I used to be prothonotary clerk of court in Blair County. Uh, all our court filings are recorded in English. Uh, it's not any other language whenever you're filing any kind of court document in our legal system. And I believe it to be the same in the city of Philadelphia, that whenever you're filing court documents, that it's all filed in English. I know many, or I know um, uh, several paralegals that, uh, um, that are multilingual, 
and they take uh, trans, uh, transcribed testimonies and uh, break that down into whatever language so that court documents can be filed in the legal system. So, you know, those means are, are currently out there if, you know, to transcribe and to, um, to interpret whether you have a large um, Hispanic population or whatever the case may be in your district, you still have means to do that to provide for your constituents, even though English would be the official language, uh, to my knowledge. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, yes, English is the essentially the official language of the courts um, of the judiciary system, um, and that's absolutely true. Um, it wouldn't get rid of all foreign languages. Um, it wouldn't, you know, deter people from learning new languages or speaking them in their daily lives. It's simply if they're communicating with the government, then English is the presumed language that you're going to use. And it would do um, nothing in the communities as well. That the, the individuals, whether it would be Chinatown or whether it would be in areas, um, you know, back in my uh, district, uh, we have. Um, we have the Bavarian Hall where you know the Germans all gathered. I'm, you know, my ancestry is German, so I can um, bring that out. But the heritage of each and every, whether it's uh, um, Slovak or whatever your background is, uh, there are a lot of groups back home that they still speak their native languages among themselves, but still English is the official language that they use in public and for documentation, for court proceedings, and everything else. And I applaud the makers of uh, these two bills, and I. Just think it's uh, long overdue in the Commonwealth. We can still represent our constituents is the point I'm trying to make here without going into all these other details. So Chairman uh, Metcalf, I appreciate the uh, allowing me this uh, line of questioning. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Representative Stern. And that uh, brings to an end uh, our questioning for uh, Ms. Bibby. Thank you very much for uh, being with us today and for traveling up uh, from DC. Thank you. We appreciate it. Have a great day. Have a safe journey home. And uh, certainly welcome to stay for the rest of the hearing. If you, if you choose to stay with us, we appreciate that. 